pase, pierna derecha, directo al arco, golazo, golazo, golazo. The world of football with a soccer perspective. This is Soccer Today with Dwayne Rollins and Kevin Laramie, live on the Sports Podcasting Network. Good day, good night, and welcome to Soccer Today for Monday, August 26th. 2019 i'm kevin laramie joined by Dwayne rollins as always why rivalry week is over and to finish rivalry week last night el trafico an entertaining game once again between lafc and the la galaxy and to talk about this great derby we have alicia rodriguez of angels on parade and mlssoccer.com how you doing alicia today i'm doing great guys how are you doing well, good as well as always, and thank you for uh, for taking some time early in your day out there as uh, as always, Alicia. So that, that's to start with the result last night, a three three draw. Obviously, as Kevin said, highly entertaining. LA jumps out to the quick lead. LAFC crawls it back. So from an LAFC perspective, is this a half full uh, result or a half empty result in the sense that they've never really been able to get their handle on their crosstown rival yet? Uh, I think it's a little bit of both. I think um, in the context of the game, it, it's a half full result because uh, at one point being down three to one, 16 minutes in, um, if you can you know claw back a, win, uh, a draw, then that's pretty good. Uh, on the other hand, if it's um, you know it, if it's if you've never beaten an opponent and you you can't, then a draw isn't good enough. Fair, fair enough. And, and uh, once again, the nemesis is, is Botan. Uh, he gets up for these games. Clearly, we might ask you a little bit about your opinion of, of his act later on. But in terms of his performance on the pitch, is there something that he brings to the game that makes it very difficult for LAFC to get get a handle on it? Or is it just a, a circumstance of a star player and, and team getting up for it? And is there something else going on there, Alicia? Well, I think it's, you know, he seems to elevate his game for these these occasions, and um, we've seen that pretty much every single outing that he's had against LAFC. Um, you know, he's somebody who says he likes to play angry, and you can see that in full effect uh, against LAFC, and I think the moment is something that he, you know, really aspires to be the centerpiece of, and, you know, he's done a really good job of, of fulfilling that so far. Um, but I also think that he's, you know, one of maybe the hardest matchup in MLS as far as his skills, his abilities, um, his size, you know, there's no other striker right now who's as big as him. And so he can, you know, just basically do uh, alley-oops on, you know, aerial balls, which he did in the last uh, matchup between the teams. Um, and that's something that, like, no defense can, you know, truly uh, properly defend. It, it kind of reminds me of, you know, sort of the heyday of Shaq uh, in the NBA when, um, you know, teams would just keep uh, – tall guys on the roster to pick up fouls because there was no other way that they could, you know, stop him. So they would, you know, they would just have a couple guys signed who would, you know, soak up five fouls a game. It's something kind of similar. And obviously uh, MLS teams don't have enough roster space to do something like that. And, you know, the game's not structured the same way. So. Well, just to go back on Zlatan, of course, we, we had a, a great Zlatan show later on where a knee in the back of Mark Anthony K. I don't know what's with Zlatan playing against Canadian player. I just have the image of him slapping Michael Petrasso on the back of the head. But uh, <laughs> Zlatan uh, kneeing Mark Anthony K. on a header. Zlatan talking back to the referee. And if you can read the lips, not necessarily nice. What do you think about the Zlatan show when it doesn't concern soccer? Um, You know, I think it's a it, it's a situation of a player who was you know kind of reaching out to to see the end is is coming and is trying to fight against it you know I, I think it's hard for any player who you know at one point at the peak of your powers you can do pretty much anything see that kind of wither away um you know and and I think that's kind of happening for him so you know as that happens some of the antics kind of ratchet up and there's no more kind of excusing it in the same kind of way because you're not performing. I mean, he's ha obviously having a very good season, but he's not, he's not having, you know, the best season in MLS right now. And um, the amount of incidents keep racking up and, you know, that's something that you can't really ignore. So in that respect, uh, you know, I, I think it's getting a little bit tiresome, but at the same time, if the guy is, is 
in the running for the golden boot, I'm guessing there's going to be a lot of people who are going to excuse it away in, in the long run. Speaking of golden boot, another player that has a great year was subbed off at the 60th minute. The antithesis, I would say, of Zlatan for LAFC, Carlos Vela, when he could felt something on the hamstring. What was your thought when you saw that substitution and how did it alter the game? You saw a lot of players talking to uh, Carlos Vela on the sideline. Carlos Vela pulling a Ronaldo on the sideline with ice on his hamstring, coaching his team, just like Ronaldo in the Euro 2016. What was your thought on Carlos Vela's game and his unfortunate substitution at the 60th minute? Yeah, obviously, uh, when you have the, the, uh, the best player you know, the, the player who's performing the best in MLS um, get, getting hurt. That's obviously uh, unfortunate. But, um, you know, I think he, he obviously made the big impact before he exited, you know, scoring the equalizer. And that was a huge boost for LAFC. Um, but then he also, uh, the fact that he had a fit when he got subbed off, I think is a good thing because, you know, he's a player who's been, touted as not uh, caring throughout his career. You know, he's, he's somebody who just collects a paycheck. He doesn't really like soccer. But I think the fact that he was so fired up about having to come out of the game, and I think he came out of the game for the right reasons, um, you know, that I think was was a smart thing in the long run, but I think also the fire that he showed was was good for, for everyone as well. Uh, Alicia, there's been a debate around MLS circles over the past uh, little while. Uh, pretty simple question. If, if LAFC fails to win the MLS Cup this year after what has been you know, undoubtedly a, a remarkable season, likely, very likely, a record-breaking season in terms of the point total, is it still a success if they do fail in the playoffs? Uh, I don't think entirely. I mean, I think it's a, it's a, a partial success. So if – sorry, there's uh, some engine noise in the background. <laughs> um, if there's – if it's a situation where, you know, they win the supporter shield, which they seem likely to do, you know, that it's obviously a very good season to get a trophy of any kind um, in their second year. But if they don't happen to win the MLS Cup, yeah, I mean, it's it's not ideal because that's obviously ultimately what teams are, are judged on. So, um, yeah, I mean, we'll see what happens in the playoffs. That's obviously the big concern at this point, but we got to get through the rest of the uh, you know, the playoffs for uh, the regular season first. Just before we say goodbye for today, Alicia, when we look at LAFC season as well, the earliest playoff clinch in history of Major League Soccer, how far can this team go? I'm not saying in the playoffs and all, but in the regular season, up until the, the beginning of October, it, can this team continue to play at this high level, sustain the great output of performance they have been putting throughout the rest of their eight games last year? I think it depends, obviously, on, on one big thing, which is health. Um, you know, if you see a, a, a team that's, you know, run as well as, as this one is, they seem like they're set up to finish the season really strong and, you know, break uh, the points records and, you know, all, all that kind of thing. But obviously, ultimately, it's going to depend on, number one, if Fella can – you know, come back and, and be strong. Hopefully with his injury, he only misses a game or two at, at most, but that he's back to his best. And then the same for the rest of the team. Um, you know, if there's a couple of big injuries late, then you never know what's going to happen, obviously. Alicia Rodriguez, thank you very much for your time today. You can follow Alicia's work by following her on social media at Soccer Musings. We wish you a great day and a great rest of the season. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. And we'll be right back after this very short break. You are listening to Soccer Today. Follow us on Twitter at Soccer Today SPN and like our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash sports podcasting network. You can find the podcast version of all the shows we do on iTunes, Apple Podcast, Google Play Store, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, and anywhere you get your podcast. And we're back on soccer today. I'm Kevin Larme, of course, with Dwayne Rollins. Dwayne, the big rivalry week finished uh, last night with a great game, 3-3, like we were talking with Alicia. For me, I, I just, I was trying to figure it out, okay? 
We're, we're watching, I've been watching LAFC and LA Galaxy for, for two years now. The games between each other have always been amazing, crazy, frantic, chaotic. That that moment that l leaves you at the edge of your seat, I don't know how to explain it. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it has anything to do with the tactics of the teams, with just the emotion of the two-star players maybe rubbing off on the rest of the team. I don't know what it is, but there's something about those two teams when they play against each other. That frantic feeling. It feels like I'm watching something from South America or CONCACAF or something. You know what I mean? That little frantic, chaotic feeling. It's hard to explain. Yeah, I think you see it in all of the, the Derby games in, in MLS. Uh, obviously, the Seattle Thunders, you see it in Montreal, Toronto, you see it in uh, New York, New York. Uh, I think you see it in all the, the games to a certain extent. But LA, certainly, I think because of the Zlatan factor. And, and, you know, sometimes we get bored of talking about what he does to everything, how big his personality is. But it really does matter here. It's because he decides that these are one of the games he's going to show up for. So Sam, with his comments last uh, couple, I guess it was about two and a half, three weeks ago now, where he talked about the playoffs and how MLS was, you know, structured in such a way it didn't make sense to him. But this is, I think, how he mentally deals with that. He just decides that there's only certain games that matter more than others, and he shows up for those games and does, you know, his own version of load management the rest of the season, which speaks to what Alicia was talking to in terms of his declining sort of um, – athleticism. I mean, he's still an incredible freak of nature, as we all see yes. when, he, when he does decide to show up. Or uh, when he so, decides yeah, to celebrate I, and take his shirt off, and you're like, yeah, I wish I looked this good when I'm in my late 30s. <laughs> Never mind my late 20s. Yeah. I, I, I wish I looked like him right yeah. now, but anyway. Yeah, both, yeah, whatever, you know, I've never had that. Anyway, but uh, nonetheless, it's, uh, he shows up, and he adds that intensity, and he adds that personality to the game, and look, if LA Galaxy get into the playoffs, you would have to, it wouldn't be the worst punt on a bet is what I'm going to say because of that factor. Um, you know, I made a joke on Twitter today that I want to make a wager that he's going to eliminate LAFC from the dream season because right now if the players were to start today and LA Galaxy were to beat Minnesota in that first round game, then they would be playing, playing LAFC at, you know, at Galaxy at Carson in the second game. So it's right there, set up to, to be, a, you know, for right the bullseye, right there, they're going to be playing each other again if the playoffs really start today. So there's lots, lots of that now, but, but I think that's what it is. It's yeah. just the intensity they decide to step it up. And in MLS, I think that does factor in, like beyond, you know, what Chan making comments like he did. You look at, you look at the impact Toronto, you look at Portland, Seattle. The, the same thing happens there because I think the players identify that game as something where the fans are more engaged so that they can show up and make a name for themselves in those games and, and they matter a bit more, you know, we can talk about whether they're real, whether El Trafico is an organic thing creation, which well, is most certainly not. It's not organic, <laughs> but it caught fire, it, right? It works. It, it works. Like, on the pitch, it doesn't matter if the team's two years old or 10 years old or 20 years old. It's the same. The the Because of the two teams are not necessarily on the same level, but a high level enough, close enough that you have that great game. And yeah, you're right, and the Zlatan aspect, and of course Zlatan could not necessarily talk to the referees the way he did uh, after getting his close to a yellow, his second yellow close to, when he kneed and elbowed Mark Anthony K on a, on a aerial ball and challenge, which then Zlatan did win, but he won because he, he need the Canadian in the back. He looks at the referee, the referee's like, quit it, or I'm going to card you, quit it, or you're getting your second yellow. That's how he looks at the referee, like, yo, shit, I'm better, who are you, this league, shit. You can read his lips, it's literally what he's saying to the referee, poor Alan Chapman on that case, but yeah, he cannot necessarily treat the referees and uh, the players that he's playing against this way, and I guess that's what rubs me the wrong way, and that's all I could see watching Zlatan last night, is... Can you respect your team? Can you respect your peers a little bit at least, and the referees a little? I don't know. It, it just rubbed me the wrong way. Yeah, look, I was a Zlatan fan before he came to Major League Soccer. I wouldn't say I'm a Zlatan hater, but I'm certainly not really a fan of what Zlatan is now. If that makes sense, he, he, it has become a little bit. It used to be sort of. 20% show, 80%, you know, 20% sizzle, 80% steak. I think it's kind of reversed now, and that makes it more difficult to handle in my mind. But, that's, you know, obviously, getting, <laughs> I have an, I don't know if the I have, a, 
I have a good analogy for you. You know what Zatan is? Zatan is the great old restaurant in town that's been there forever. It's great. It's good. But do you really want to wait in line three hours to have the same damn thing? It's good. It's still going to be great. It's going to be great until it closes. It's going gonna, it's gonna to score goals. That smoked meat sandwich from Schwartz is delicious. But do you want to wait three hours in line before you get there? Or you go next door, which is very similar quality. But the accessibility is a lot easier. I think that's what Zlatan is for me. I, he's not accessible to me because he doesn't treat human beings with respect. Are you telling me that the smoked meat in Montreal should be purchased from the place that the locals purchase it from rather than the place that the tourists line up to, Kevin? Uh, well, whenever anyone asks me where they should go for smoked meat, Schwartz is never the answer. It's always where? Okay. Well, where are you going? Are you going in this part of town? Where in this part of town, there's this place. If you're going this way, there's this place. Why well, Try some variety. Variety is the spice of life. Schwartz, eh, it's overrated. And that's the same for me. Zlatan is Schwartz Deli. All right. In September, you're going to have to let me know where to buy the bagels then because where I go is oh, yeah. a bit of a sometimes. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, yeah. I, I have a perfect place for bagels too. And it's not the two that people think about. Well, that's enough. Can, can you notice that I did not have my breakfast yet? So, so maybe I'm getting a little bit hungry. But uh, let's continue. We've talked about LAFC, LA Galaxy. 3-3, a very entertaining game. If you haven't watched did yet watch the first 30 minutes and you'll you'll have your money's worth i was with a friend on the phone watching in the background and only i i found myself doing is literally doing the play-by-play -play. oh wow lafc scored oh wow la galaxy scored oh man the galaxy oh wow three one are you serious it was that type of game but there was other games this weekend too Dwayne. let's just go back to friday we'll look at the schedule and we'll get down to montreal and toronto when we get there and we'll talk about it in a bit of more details and then We'll talk a little bit about what's happening in the front offices of Montreal too. Some some firing, some some people leaving, and uh, leaves a lot of gap open in the front office heading into the future. And we might even know, or at least have a good idea of who the sporting director is going to be from Montreal. So we'll talk about this when we get to Toronto and Montreal. Orlando, Atlanta to start rivalry week on Friday. One nothing, Atlanta. A win, a good win on the road for. What could be right now the best team in the Eastern Conference? I don't think there's a could be about it. I think it's pretty clear that they're the, they're the hottest team. Well, NYCFC will, will make an argument to me for sure in that, and I will um, accept that. NYCFC is kind of under the radar right now, which is funny to say, considering how much star power they had in the past. They, of course, have changed their, their look, much like their crosstown rivals, and, and have done very well. Um, I'm sure Atlanta fans are loving that I'm talking about NYCFC when you're having an Atlanta game here. But nonetheless, you're, you're right. And I think that game is also Orlando. They needed to get they need to get some upset points if they're going to claw their way above that red line. And, and this is a lost opportunity for them in a rival game, a rival game that they typically struggle in. Um, so I, I think that when you look at Orlando's schedule played off so far and, and how many games they have left, and it, it's hard for me to see them climb their way up. And in fact, we'll talk a lot about the playoff race through this. Uh, I think there's there's uh, maybe yeah. room for one team below to get above, and that has to do with the falling stone that we'll talk about in a minute. And I'm the, sure. The, the falling stone, uh, the falling Englishman stone, and the place in the capital of Washington, D.C. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. Portland, Seattle. Seattle with the victory on the road Friday night against their Cascadia rival, their Pacific Northwest rival, of the Portland Timbers, Seattle to Portland one. There was a protest from the Timbers Army at the 30th minute, closer to 33 minutes. They were silent uh, up until that point to talk about the uh, the ban on political uh, uh, banners. I would say I didn't want to say ban and banner in the same sentence, but I guess I did. Uh, so there's there's an, there was an aspect. There was some, some banned banners. There was some some people ejected for wearing normal not necessarily non-political flag of course and there was a lot of uh, of uh, protests and confrontations with uh, a lot of iconography some of them were allowed some of them were not allowed so there's been some protests in that game too and that was across the league this weekend too we've seen the protests from supporters group show up at least different iconography showing up as well in different supporters group yeah it 
Yeah, and look, there are, are better places to get into supporters' issues than this podcast. We tend to stay away from them, but but certainly we recognize that the Timbers Army staying silent for 33 minutes did did certainly make an impact on on the quality of the broadcast, on on the quality of the atmosphere in the stands. It was noticeable for sure. Whether or not it has any lasting effect on on the ch- and changing policy is what I mean. Whether it has any effect there, that remains to be seen. Um, I have trouble seeing that happening, but I've been wrong before, so uh, perhaps I'll be wrong again here. Yeah. Again, when it comes to this this issue, Kevin, I think we both are sympathetic to what they're fighting for, but at the same time, I maybe I'm just too cynical. I've seen, seen yeah, too well, many protests we've seen, start yeah. well and, and just fizzle out. Yeah. We've, we've seen a lot of them so over the years. Oh. I've seen my fair share of them here, too, but yeah, I, I thought it was at least worthy of a mention, but Seattle won that game 2-1 against the rival Portland. And then moving to Saturday, the Hudson River Derby. New York is blue. NYCFC winning this game, even though they got a red card during that game. 2-1 for the blue side of New York, or 2-1 for the actual team that plays in New York. And NYCFC are becoming a contender now in the Eastern Conference, more than a contender. Maybe the second best team or 1A best team right now in the Eastern Conference, the Red Bulls are going to struggle to to stay up the Eastern Conference table. It's not as easy as it once was for the Toros. Yeah, well, NYCFC points per game has the best in in the East right now. So when we talk about Atlanta, I think a lot of that is their bias coming in from from this recency bias, really. I mean, kind of recency bias in a sense because they are the champions last year. So it is hard for us to not think that they are better than the team that has continually struggled when when the season got real and that's NYCFC but when you look at points per game uh, they are one point literally behind Philadelphia and Atlanta in the standing now and, and have more points per game than we're uh, goal differential so they absolutely are a team to be reckoned with this year which is and you also look at the form because they were terrible at the end of May and have completely turned it around since then to be a dominant team with a record comparable to LAFC and since, since then whether they can continue that and you know when the business end hits History suggests they have not been able to do it before, but then again, what does you know Pirlo have to do with now? That's what I always say when we're talking <laughs> about history and playoffs and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, has nothing to do with it. New England two, Chicago one. We're not going to dwell on this one. Toronto two, Montreal one. We're going to dwell on this one though. Toronto two, Montreal Montreal Impact one. Let's start with this one. Did the choice of Greg Vanny to bench Pozuelo to start the game lit a fire under the asses of the collective of Toronto FC? Uh, I don't want to give it that much credit. Greg Vanny's <laughs> greatest weakness in my mind is that he overthinks. I mean, the, uh, the alternative way to put that is when he put Pozuelo into the game, that's what TFC turned it around. <laughs> so there you go, but... Because they, they struggled, they huffed and puffed, and they had a lot of mugs uh, down the wings in the first half. They were getting a lot of crosses in, but there was nothing there. They were, there was no one in the box to fight it. And people were pointing out to me that one of the reasons for that is because they had no creativity in the center, that Josie was dropping back further, which meant when the ball was going to the box, there was no one to attack the ball. So it's all fine and dandy to have wing play, but if you don't have anyone to attack the ball when you get it into the box, then what the hell does it matter? So then he changes it up, puts Pasvala back in the second half, and, and I think outside of uh, Borian's goal, it was a fairly comprehensive um, performance by TFC in that. I mean, that was really Montreal's only true chance. And, yeah, no, it was. Uh, especially um, in the last one. Montreal did not have a lot of chances. It was hard for Wilmer Cabrera to affect any changes in this team because his first training was Thursday. So Wednesday is all is when it all happened. So by Thursday for his first full training, like Dwayne, just to put things in perspective, Rémy Garde was the one training the team on Wednesday morning. And you go to Thursday morning and it's not Rémy Garde, it's Wilmer Cabrera, a different strategy, but there's not a lot of time to implement things. And at least Montreal did not concede on a free kick. Small victories. It's, it's already a victory. Uh, and then Montreal was able to Staying in tight, 2-1. Uh, of course, the winner came later. But uh, it could have been a bit better. Evan Bush, though, is a bit to blame for this one. Very rarely would I blame a goalkeeper in Major League Soccer or in any soccer 
conversation for, for a loss or for a goal. But if you look technically how he handled the second one, any goalkeeper coach will gladly describe to you the mistakes that he did and not putting his body behind that ball, even though it was a bit outside of his reach, it was close enough to be able to put more muscle behind the ball to be able to protect his net so that what did happen does not happen. The ball rolled over his gloves after uh, that shot and it's 2-1 Toronto. There's a mistake there. And now it's easy. And we'll talk about Vancouver in a minute. And it's easy to do the correlation. Oh, Maxime Crepeau just did the record of saves for a goalkeeper in Major League Soccer. The impact just gave him away for 50K last season. And apparently they barely watched any of the games he did in Ottawa for the last two years before that. And Montreal just gave him away. He could have been a lot better for Montreal than Evan Bush. Blah, blah, blah. The comparisons and the, the, the jealousy is easy here. But we'll, we'll get to Maxime Crepeau and the Whitecaps in a few minutes. But Evan Bush, I guess I have to, to commit here. I guess he's has a lot of, uh, not, all, not all of the blame, but he has some of the blame for that loss for sure. Yeah, look, I, I'll say this. I didn't think it was Evan Bush's best performance of the year by far. And when you look at statistically speaking, look at who scored and, um, you know, American soccer analysts and places like that, Evan yeah. Bush statistically is trending right at the bottom, right? So there, <laughs> yeah. there are lots of red flags coming up with Bush's play this year. Okay, so, so that here, said, one thing, Dwight, before we move on. Last year was his contract year. He had to play well, and at the end of the year, sign a new contract, and then this year, it's this. Are there correlations? Probably not. But, hey, it's just a fact. So, yeah, so I don't know. know. It doesn't help, but the... It doesn't help that the player, that the young player that we're talking about, that we'll talk about him in the morning, his name is Crapo. It doesn't help in no. those comparisons, right? So <laughs> th- there you go. If you change um, Maxime Crapo for Tom, Tom, I don't know, Tom Lassiter, so whatever. Tom Lassiter, yeah. yeah. There's there's no controversy here. That that's true. That's very fair. Like if yeah, it, if yeah. it, if I Maxime mean, Crapo was Troy Perkins, we would not hear about it. No, but, but it's not. So we are going to put it, but. But nonetheless, I will say this. When we talk about moral and goal, yes, a professional keeper should get in front of that ball and block it out because moral blasted it right at him and it went through him and into the goal. You can't allow that as a full goal. But you also, as a professional defense, can't let Justin Morrow get into a point blank. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it is a team goal. Oh, um, and, and Morrow should have done better. He should have placed the ball better. It went through the legs of Bakary Sanga, too. And I was like, oh, man, I feel for him. It's the only. It's the f- the fifth time in his career, he's playing center back after doing it a few times for the France national team and for um, Marseille, I believe, back then. Well, he made a hell of a, a the block. There was a, when, I forget who it was. CFC broke down 2 and one uh, I think it was late in the first half, and he made a hell of a block on oh, a yeah. cross that would have been a tap-in goal. So, yeah. Oh, I... <laughs> uh, Bakary Sanya Dwayne, like as a Manchester City fan for you, you you'll, it'll correlate with you. I'm going to say it. Bakary Sanya has impressed me since the day he came to Montreal. We don't talk about him enough. His professionalism, the way he cares, and he he seems to care about this team. He's fighting. He gets angry when we concede. He gets angry after losses. He goes in the locker room. He's a leader in this place, and a leader maybe not enough. He should take that void right now that is in the locker room because when I say locker room, I just mean between the players. I just mean like on the field. I'm not going to say locker room. He should should he should continue he was wearing the armband for the game against Toronto Saturday and Bakary Sanya for me has always showed me a true professional aspect but more than that it's more than a professional he cares it feels like he's bleeding blue black and white right now and telling it's a uh, it was his fifth time in his career that he saw a coach fired too and it's normal and it's we have to take part of the blame all the good things but they don't seem like cliche when he says it they seem truly to come from the heart truly to come from what he's thinking and how he's feeling and i have to say back at saying i i he was not on my radar personally before i'm a chelsea fan and he's always playing for arsenal for man city but yeah i have to say that guy's pure class and it's a joy to watch him, not only on the field, but it's a joy to watch him share his knowledge to a Zachary Brogillard, help him ZBG become a better 
better player and a better person this year too. Yeah, Bakary Sangadoin needs to uh, to be recognized a bit more for his contributions just joining the Impact last year. I think to continue our, our conversation from earlier, if Bakary Sangadoin's name was Bob Smith, we probably would be hearing more about him because I, I think he suffers a little bit from playing in Montreal and suffers a little bit from the fact that he's not an American or even an Anglo in the world, right? So there, there's that, but I don't want to get too much into the weeds of those kind of conversations today. It certainly, I don't think it's his fault in those goals. And, and Montreal Impact fans should not watch Delgado's goal in slow motion too. Go through two people's legs <laughs> before it goes into the goal. Exactly. So, one of them, you know, one of them, Sanya. So, <laughs> so like, uh, and you feel yeah. bad for them too because the ball was bouncing before, right? So it's kind of hard to to anticipate where that bounce is going to go. And you see Sanya trying to stop it, and it didn't take a bad bounce, and it goes straight between the legs, not megging him. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, don't look at those in slow motion because you'll you'll be like, yeah, what am I doing here once again? Oh yeah, yeah, I could retire. Yeah, I could. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, it look. I, I didn't think. I, I heard someone point out, and, and as much as Impact fans are going to emotionally focus on the game on Saturday as being, you know, vital importance, I think logically speaking, um, Cabrera and the rest of the team was looking at the next three home games as being more important than the Toronto game. Not that you ever, not that they ever would admit that they were almost going to yeah. lay that one up. But, but in terms of being able to turn things around, it doesn't make a lot of sense that, that they could do it in two days there. They were going to do what they could, and then they have to focus on the three home games. And you're right. I think the two games upcoming, two games against Toronto in September for the Canadian Championship are more important for Montreal, too. Because at least if you win the Canadian Championship, you can say you got something out of the season. If you missed a playoff and you don't win the Canadian Championship, you literally finish the season with nothing. You, you carry over no success or no contribution or no entry into a new competition to, to the year following. So if Montreal gets the Canadian Championship, they can say, well, at least we got a qualification to the Champions League. And that could help us with the little bump in allocation to get a few players for the 2020 season. And also the home games following the three home games, starting with Vancouver on Wednesday at home is the time that I need at least at least a week to prepare this team. So you're right, the game against Toronto was like, well, let's do what we can and we'll actually affect and implement changes for maybe the first or the second home game coming in the series after. But yeah, for Toronto, it's a big win, though. If we look at the standings quickly, it does give Toronto a uh, a playoff spot as we speak in seven with 37 points three points in front of Montreal and uh, Toronto has one more game to play than the impact the impact has only six games left in the league let's continue quickly before we say goodbye for today with the rest of the results in Major League Soccer Philly three DC United one yep I just put a fork in it Dwayne DC's done well, they're falling like a rock. I mean, you mentioned Toronto at 37 points. They're only two points back in D.C. D.C. Plays two more, has played two more games. So, you know, that's, I think, the team that most teams below those red lines should be looking at right now. Is uh, we uh, well, Two weeks ago, I said I thought D.C. had put enough points on the board that, that they should be fine to make the playoffs, but they probably weren't going to do anything in it. Now I'm going to say I don't think they're fine for the playoffs because right now I have 45 points as the magic number in my mind, um, maybe 46, it might be 44, but somewhere around 45. And I don't see how DC United is going to find eight more points in the current form. So it, it's, you know, fork. Yeah, perhaps they're going to have to step it up and uh, wait for yeah. facing the suspension. Um, <laughs> you know, he, what? has he checked out anyway? You know, <laughs> well, exactly. It's his fault. I think the, I think every player in that team, and I might be speaking out of turn, I might, I might not know what I'm talking about. And, you know, if you are a DC United player and you are listening to this right now, tell me, DM me. I'll open my DMs. Tell me if I'm right or wrong. But it seems to me that when Rooney announced that he was leaving for Derby, people felt disappointed. People felt abandoned. Players felt like, yeah, you don't believe in this project. And you're just going to get up and run. You don't like this league. You don't like the travel. You you miss England. And you're going to check out anyways. And the effort shown since that announcement 
might be part of it too. But this team has lost its soul. Its soul is somewhere in the Atlantic on a boat on its way to Derby County. Yeah, look, and Wayne really did well at the beginning of the time he was here. He certainly gave his all, but I, I, I can't help but I, I thought this at the time, is that when it all played out, that DC United would have been better off just letting him go down. There would have been less of a distraction around. Um, they maybe would have been able to, they would have gained an international spot back. And maybe they could have added something to try and help them solidify the things. It would have been a bit of a hit to those that had bought tickets and so on and so forth, but you didn't have that anyway. Um, I think that it's kind of was a mistake to force him or even ask him, it's not say force because he agreed, to ask him to stay yeah. for, for the rest of the season. I think it would have been better off to just let him go to Derby County and immediately start into to changing his role over. That would have been the... It's hard to do that, though. And look, I think most of us have followed a team where there's been a player that, that you like and that has done well for your club that wants out and you don't want to let him go. But at the same time, when he stays, it's, be careful what you wish for. And I think maybe that might be a bit of what's happening with DC United right now and their fans. So, yeah, yeah falling stone, sinking ship, <laughs> use your own analogy. They do not look strong right now. <laughs> They don't. And we'll click, quickly finish because Dwayne and I both want to talk about Vancouver and the Maxim Crippo. You think so? RSL 2, Colorado 0, Cincinnati 1, Columbus 3. And yes, they got stuck in the net and they almost caused a battle. Watch the highlight if you want to know more. FC Dallas 5, Houston Dynamo 1. Yeah, Wilmer Cabrera was not the problem. Houston, you have more than one problem. LAFC 3, LA Galaxy 3. We've talked about this one. Let's go back. To Avaya Stadium, San Jose, three, Vancouver, one, 43 shots for San Jose. Maxim Cripo, 16 saves, the most amount of saves in a Major League Soccer game ever. My question to you, Dwayne, is, is it an actual feat to have 16 saves? Or are you have, or, or do you have to look at your defense and be like, what are you guys doing? Why am I peltered with 43 shots in a game? I, at a much, much lower level, I have been in goal and in leagues where I have been on teams that are very good and I have been in teams that are very bad. And when I'm on teams that are very bad, I sometimes make a lot of saves. I usually let in a lot of goals. Exactly. <laughs> so it's, and it's, it's actually, you want the middle level as a keeper. You want a little bit of action, but not too much. But uh, yeah, it, it's, look, Max Cavo is, I think, a very good shot stopper. Um, what he needed in his career was to consistently play and to organize a back line um, and to do all of that other leadership stuff. You know, is he all there yet? No, I don't think so. And well, I think that the, know, marshalling, of- the marshalling the back line point that you mentioned, I think it's not just on him, but but I think there's work there. There needs to be a lot of work there. It's in the recruitment. And hey, it's not only there. The, the impact is the same thing. So I, I'm not like... Ron Fanny might be on his way back to Montreal. That's the newest thing that's on uh, on social media right now. So uh, apparently he's on his way back to Montreal to finish the season with the impact because they need help at the center back position. But to go back to Vancouver, Cripo needs to be able to 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 learn better how to influence the back line, or he needs to have better defenders in front of him so he's not pelted with forty three balls during a game, which led to a record performance. But in, in my mind, it's a record that you do not want. It's not like Yay, it makes you the... No, it's just like, yeah, you had a lot of shots today on you and you did your best. But 16 saves out of 43 shots, not all of them were on target, obviously, because otherwise the scoreline would have been a lot different. But I thought it was worth mentioning that, yeah, a lot of people are saying, oh, look at his great historical performance. Great saves, the amount of saves. Oh, we miss him in Montreal. We should have kept him. Yeah, but if it wasn't for the defense allowing so many shots, they might have won that game. They were never close. Uh, San Jose and Wondolowski, surprising me. Always well-placed. That guy is always where he thinks the ball will end. And most of, most of the time, the ball ends exactly there. But yeah, it's it's uh, for Vancouver, it's a disappointment, yes. But I think I think it's nothing new now for Vancouver this year. And it's it's all about 2020. It's, uh, it's not about 2019 anymore. Well, yeah, and when you're talking about mass control, it's all about 2022. This is all part of the learning material. And he's proven. He's athletic and he can stop shots. And as a Canadian national team guy, as a backup uh, to Brian, I think he's, he's perfectly, you know, what we've seen his development this year, uh, combined with some of the play of, of the Canadian Premier League teams, makes me comfortable as a Canadian national team observer fan 
uh, that the goalkeeping position is going to be okay for a few years because Morian well, yeah, is pretty young still too uh, for a keeper. So yeah, it, it's good there. But in terms of you know whether or not he would have made a difference to the impact this year, what, what I'll say is this: is I don't think he would have hurt the impact this year. And, and you can make yeah. an argument that that you would have preferred to keep the younger local product. That's a fair argument to be made. But I don't think it's it would be a, a magic bullet no. answer to what you're talking about. Cri- um, Maxim Kripo, him on uh, Vancouver. Yeah, well, I was going to say Maxim Kripo with the impact does not make the impact uh, healthier. And it does not give the Montreal impact back Nacho Piatti. And it does not give the impact 15 more goals a year, which they're missing this year compared to other years. So so their their problems have nothing to do with Max Crippo. But it's it's an easy cop-out to say. And it sounds good on social media for, for your local friends as well. To be like, oh, yeah, we should have kept the local guy. You know, the local guy was better and uh, it would have been cheaper. So we should have kept the local guy. It's, it's always easy to say yeah. after, too. Isn't it from Ottawa? <laughs> well, they played for the Montreal Impact Academy, I guess. So, so but yeah, like, yeah, we wish the best for Maxime Crepo. And maybe sometimes you have to get out of Dodge. Sometimes you're better off playing somewhere else than home. And sometimes you're recognized a bit better abroad than you are at home. So yeah, I know. Yeah, what I'm talking no, about. it's the Jordan Hamilton argument, although he needs to find his way into that lineup too before yeah. he ends up back in the CPL, which would be a perfectly fine. Uh, outcome as well. He, you know, I think Jordan Hamilton's at a crossroads that way. I don't know how they got in Jordan Hamilton out of this, but nonetheless, um, Maxim Kripo is, I think, he, I said this on, uh, just to finish our thought on the Whitecaps. I mean, it was a dreadful performance for them overall, being overshadowed by the fact that the keeper stood in his head to keep it from not being like 7-1. Yeah. Um, it, 12. Really, this team, um, unfortunately, and I think the blame goes a long way across a lot of different levels, including MDS shares some of the blame for this year because he didn't necessarily recruit to the way that he, maybe he understands a little better now and can recruit a little better. I think maybe MDS recruited for a team like he did in the past, thinking that he could put like the, you know, the San Francisco Deltas into Major League Soccer and make the playoffs. And that's not the case. So lots of learning to do there. There are maybe three, four, five pieces from this, this team that I think are going to be legitimate factors moving forward for the Whitecaps. Kripo is one of them, though. And that's a good thing. Young yeah. keeper to grow with. Um, the young back line. I mean, Daniel Henry is still fairly young. Um, it, 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 there's, there's still yeah. pieces there. But, yeah, there's a lot of there's going to be a lot of changes in the Whitecaps. I just think they, they do – have a keeper that they can move forward with and have him continue to develop. Um, he's shown one part of his game is good. Can he build the rest of them? He's going to have to be in a better team to do a lot of that because when chaos is happening, it's a little hard to marshal chaos, right? Yeah, and we want uh, Kripo to stay with the Canadian Men's National Team forever because he's a keeper. Oh, yes, we do like Maxim Kripo. But on, on that, exactly. On that note, on that cheesy joke, you can follow Dwayne on social media at 24th Minute and myself at Kev Laramie and this show at Soccer Today SBN. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Make sure you like our Facebook page, facebook.com slash sports podcast network and subscribe to the podcast feed to listen to us every day. Talk about the world of football with a soccer perspective. On that note, if you're looking for the full archives of the show, if you can't find it, you can always find every show we ever did on sportspodcastingnetwork.com. Until tomorrow, where Dwayne and I will travel across the pond to talk about the European game and the European topics coming out of this weekend in a few different leagues that we follow across the pond. And until then, as always, make sure you give us a $2 a month if you like Canadian soccer at patreon.com slash sports podcasting network. And until tomorrow, have a great soccer. You can find the podcast version of all the shows we do on iTunes, Apple Podcast, Google Play Store, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, and anywhere you get your podcast.